Okay, we're, we're starting Genesis today. We didn't last week because there was some muck on the roads and stuff. Uh, and so we're, gonna, we're starting, starting this week. Um, what, before we, because what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you some, some background that I'm going to use as I, as I kind of teach or help us go through Genesis. Now, right at the beginning, you don't have to accept the background I'm given. I, I, it's something that I believe, and I believe it because I, I think that's what's going on here. But, and that's going to be apparent as we get through it, it go through it. If you're, that's not your perspective, just listen, you know, just and be involved. But I'm not saying that you're, that you're wrong. Because who knows? I mean, geez, we all do the best we can. Inter- interpret. It'll be apparent as when we when we get started. So I don't want you to. I wouldn't want nowadays, and I don't think that would happen with anybody here. But you know, nowadays people kind of sometimes get mad. You know, if some they hear something they don't like or disagree with, and I don't want that to happen. You know, so you know we can kind of flow through this. I think. Um, and that's, so that's what we're going to be doing as we look at Genesis. Before we, we look at any of the background, and then the first two chapters, uh, what, do, what do you know about Genesis? Tell me what you know about Genesis right here, right now. Genesis, Genesis is. Yeah, the beginning. Is the beginning, okay. Why, why would you say Genesis is the beginning? Because that's when God made the world. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's about, so creation is involved in Genesis. Tell me what else. What do you know about Genesis? That's where the human race started from. Okay, human race is involved in, in Genesis. Okay. All right. um, Adam and Eve in the garden and okay. sin. Adam and Eve in the garden and sin. That's trees. right. Oh, and by the way, Peg, I really like those apple little apple turnovers that you gave me. I thought that was appropriate. When we talk about Adam and Eve and sin, I thought that was really, seemed to fit in real well. Uh, <laughs> right there. Uh, they were, they, I'll tell you, they were quite a temptation. Um, so, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're, you're well, you're well. Okay, uh, so we're going we're gonna to look at Genesis. Um, and, there's, there's a couple of things I think is important just to file away and to sort of entertain. Uh, the, the book of Genesis is, is not like some of the books we look, in fact, it's, it's different than any of the books we look at, we've looked at in the New Testament. Because the books in the New Testament that we've looked at were written at a time. So you ask, when was it written? Well, it was written between 90 and 95. Uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. Well, it was written, you know, around 50, 52 maybe. You, know, you could really kind of pinpoint that and it was written as one, one document. Book of Genesis is, a, is a really different uh, because the book of Genesis, even though it was compiled, may be compiled at about the same time, it's the result of a lot of different, lot of different stories. And, and those stories were written at different times. Uh, that the, the so you could almost you almost can't talk about the writer of Genesis, but more the the people who compiled the story in Genesis, and they respected the stories enough to keep the stories as they are. They didn't go in and edit the stories to make them fit together really neatly. A lot of times, the story in Genesis, the stories, and we'll see that don't fit very closely together. And that's because the person, the people who compiled it, they weren't stupid. They knew that. But the stories themselves were important enough to leave as is. So, now, that's, that's what Genesis is. So it's just this collection of these ancient, ancient stories. These almost, you'd say, prehistory stories. Now, when you look at Genesis, they're... they're some, some scholars, and, and I tend to agree with them with an asterisk. I don't think it's quite that this simple. Uh, they see at least three strands in Genesis. In other words, uh, three, not writers, but sort of time periods in which stuff was writing, be, written. Because everything in Genesis is directed to people who lived at the time that they received it. That's something else we want to be real careful when we look at any kind of scripture. Sometimes we, we assume scripture is directed for us living in our time. 
Well, it certainly has meaning now. But when Paul wrote to the Romans, he wasn't writing to the people in, in Sligo. Yeah, he wasn't writing to the Presbyterian Church in Sligo or Rymersburg. You know, he was writing to a church in Rome. And so he was dealing with their problems using images that were meaningful to them that we have to kind of understand and apply. But we can't just take the words and say, oh, well, those words apply to us. And, and we want to be real careful when we do that. So as, as we look at Genesis, these stories are being directed at very specific people at different times. So they're written to be meaningful to them. And so we have to kind of get into their heads so that it can become meaningful to us. If we just take the words and apply it, then I, we end up, I think, misreading what the stories mean and how they can influence our lives. One of the things we've got to be real careful about, and we tend to do it, we assume that everything is rational, you know, historical, scientific, because that's truth. And therefore, what's in, Gen in Genesis is a historical record, or a geological record, or a scientific record. When you're talking about people for whom that's not meaningful, to suggest that would, would be the writer, the compilers of Genesis, the writer of these stories, could care less about the people that were receiving it. All he cared about was us. And that's, that didn't make any sense to me. So we kind of got to get into their minds, their mindsets, and see the world through their eyes so that we can understand what the writer is saying to us you know, by saying it to them. Okay, now, like I said, I think when we look at Genesis, there are three three strains in Genesis. And we're going to see it today. We're going to, a great example is in the first two chapters. There was, there's a strain, and, and you can, the scholars identify it, the, at least the first two, by the name used for God. Do you realize, and we, we don't see it quite so easily in English translations, but you do when you look at the Hebrew. There's a lot of names for God in, in the in the Bible, a lot of names for God. In Hebrew, the name, the word God is El. And El plural, or God plural, is Elohim. That's the name, that's a name for God. But that's called, like calling God, God. Now, the name that comes from the bush is with Abraham, you know, in the burning bush, are three, four letters that were never pronounced by the Jews. They are four letters. Uh, and since the Jews didn't pronounce them, I'm not either, you really can't because there are no vowels. I mean, the way they're written, they're written so you can't pronounce it. But when the Greeks translated their Old Testament, they translated that proper name for God as Curios, uh, uh, Lord. So when you look in your Bible and you see Lord in all caps, you ever look at Psalms mm -hmm. and all those? That's the name, that three-letter name for God. That's where that three-letter name for God uh, is used. It's not just because when, they, when, they tra when the Jews would read it and hit those four letters, they'd never pronounce it out loud because pronouncing the name of God would be taking control over God. And you don't want to do that. It's like acting in the name of God. No Jew would say, I'm acting in the name of God. That means you have God's authority, and you can't claim God's authority. And so when you hit those letters, you didn't even pronounce the name. Instead, you said the word Adonai. And Adonai is a, Greek, is a Hebrew word for Lord that that's the Greeks translate in their translation. Anyway, there's a strain inside of Genesis where that name is used for God. So when God is described in a story, and it's those four letters, some people call, talk about it being Yahweh, Okay, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. They, you, you really aren't supposed to, Jews would never say it. That's not what a Jew would ever say. But there's a strain where that's the name for God. And, and in those stories, probably they're the earliest stories. And in those stories, you know, not only do you see that as the name of God, but God is very, very personal. You know, it's the God that shows up. It's the God that appears in front of people. It's the God that's in the garden. It's the God that leads. It's the God that talks to people. That's, and it's, and it's very ancient, and it's, and it's probably associated with the southern kingdom because in those stories, a lot of locations in South Palestine are mentioned. 
So it's probably somebody in the southern kingdom, maybe a year through uh, 1,000, is putting together these stories or getting these stories down. The key is that's the name for God. When God is mentioned, those, that's the name that's used. There's another strain that's a little later, probably associated with the north, that that's uses the word El or Elohim. When you see stories where El is used, and in other words, this personal name for God isn't, but El is, or Elohim is. It seems to be another strain that have characteristics. Like in that, God does not show up and talk to you. Like God, like we'll see today, you know, the story God talking to Adam and Eve in the garden, that's not how God communicates in this strain. He communicates in visions and in dreams. That's how people, that's how he talks to them. Now that's consistent when you go through these stories where that name for God is used. You know, it it's, tends to be God becoming a little less personal, which means we're talking maybe something that's a little more recent to us. You know, so God seems to become more detached as time goes on. Really close to less and less close. That's another strain. We're going to see that this, the story of uh, Isaac, J, uh, 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 Abraham sacrificing Isaac is an Elohim, is an El story. The third strain that you see was written by the priests, and they're much, that's much later. And you can tell the priestly writing because they're the ones that are obsessed with structure. They are really big. You know, when you read Genesis and you hit names, you ever read through Genesis and you get a whole chapter full of names? Mm -hmm. Somebody begotten somebody else? And you're thinking, geez Louise, I can't get through this. This is really dull. You know who wrote that? A priest. Because that was a big deal. And if you count generations, that's a big deal. Numbers are important. Structure's important. We're going to see probably the most obvious priestly story in Genesis in what we're looking at today. A story, again, not going to use a personal name for God in it, but it's going to be highly structured, where structure is very important. Priests hung around the temple. They had temple worship. There were certain rules you followed. The priests were really into those, those rules. So that's going to be, that's going to be one of the, the strains that we see when we look at Genesis. And as we go through it, it'll become kind of apparent. Now, whoever put Genesis together was well aware that he was dealing with different stories. And like I said, allowed those stories to, to stand on their own. So he didn't go into one story and change the name for God to make them all the same. You know, he let the stories sort of speak for themselves. And I think that's, that's really and powerful. who wrote Genesis? I just I was well, going to ask him. Well, <laughs> who wrote it? Each of these stories is being written by different people at different times. It's almost like when was Genesis compiled? Genesis was probably compiled as, a, as this book somewhere around the, the year four, between the year 400, 500 BC. That's probably when we first have Genesis as, as a book with all these stories. But there are stories in there that go back another thousand years before that, some of which were passed down orally, some were written down. Remember, writing is very expensive. Yeah. You know, so passed down orally, somebody decided to compile them. Now it's also, and just sort of as a to throw out there, Genesis wasn't the only book that compiled these stories. There was another one that was done almost entirely by priests called the Book of the Jubilees. And that was the Genesis story too in that book. The, the, er, the Jews who started to put together a scripture, a word, didn't believe the Book of the Jubilees was inspired. So they didn't include it in their work. But it's an outline of, of Genesis. It's an outline of Genesis. And, and y'all may not know this, you may. You know, in, in the Quran, it's the, the story of Genesis. So that's another, using the same characters by somebody else later. So the book of Genesis is just one of, of a, several books that compile these stories. This is the one that the Jews believed was inspired. This is the one that the church considers inspired. This is the one I consider inspired. The other ones are nice to know information, and you can look at them, and they're interesting, but this is, this is God's means of speaking to us.
So Genesis probably was compiled, written is harder because they're stories that are sort of almost independent that were compiled. It was really compiled about that. Any other questions before we get into chapter 1? Now, like I said, the stories of Genesis, I think, are written to, to very definite people and often written at different times. And in Genesis 1 and 2, I think we have two very distinct creation stories. Two of them. Not one, but two. And written, again, with different intentions. Because it's what the story is conveying that's important. This is, I don't think, intended to be a geological history of the world. Instead, what is the meaning? What, what does the, the, the writer want the, the reader to take away from this story? Other than you know, some kind of historical fact. That's, and that's what we're going to be looking at, actually, with all the Genesis stories. Okay, so why, why, in fact, why would there be, why might there be two different creation stories in one book? Why might, why might that be the case? Two different writers. Okay, you've got two different writers, you know. He keeps taking my words. Yeah. <laughs> Van, uh, next time. One, let 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 Shelly. Okay. Let Shelly. Uh, <laughs> And I can't believe it. Somebody spoke before you. I know. I know. That's really something. Uh, the, uh, so you got two different writers writing to two different people, you know, that have different interests, live different different places. That's really good. Uh, and and the two stories may have a different point, you know, and that's what we want to kind of look at. So we've got, and that's why it's kind of dangerous. I have a, a person I talked to about this, and. Uh, he, he said, well, you know, this is, they're not two different stories. They're one, it's, it's one story. What's missing is a big gap between chapter one and chapter two, where God destroys the first creation and starts over. Well, okay, I, I guess you could say that. That makes me nervous because I've got to add a lot to the Bible that's not there. If the biblical writers had wanted that, first destruction to be in there, they would have put it in there. The fact that they didn't probably means either, certainly, it, I don't think it happened, but they didn't see it as important. So I think that's making an inference, and you're only doing that to make sure the two, you can hold the two together historically. Well, we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to let them flow. Uh, and see what each of them might teach us. Okay, so we've got your Bible open, Genesis 1, 1. How does Genesis begin? In the beginning. In the beginning. Now, why is the book called Genesis? Because that means beginning. Because that means beginning in Greek. Uh, that's what it means. And in fact, when you read the story about Jesus in um, Matthew 18, where Matthew is starting to talk about the birth of Jesus, usually in his translations, it says the birth of Jesus happened in this way. The word isn't birth. The word is Genesis. That's the word that the evangelist Matthew uses. So, and I think that's very intentional because he's not talking yeah. about the birth of Jesus. He's talking about the creation. the creation, the beginning. And there's so many parallels between Matthew and, and Genesis. There's a lot going on there. And I think Matthew, so Matthew intentionally did it. So we've got in the beginning, Genesis is the beginning. Tell me about the beginning. What does the writer? God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, God created the heavens and, and the earth, right? And what was, what was the state of things? Again, according to this, this writer, what was the state of things at the beginning? They were formless. Okay, the earth was formless and dark and empty and dark. Uh, okay, formless and dark. Now, dark is pretty good because we talked about dark before dark as a symbolic, you know, symbolic image. You know, the darkness usually suggests what? Sin. Okay, it suggests sin, separation, emptiness, all this thing. What else does it say? So there was it was void, it was but it wasn't nothing. You know, people if people, if somebody looks at this and says, Well, what was in before God created? Well, there was there was nothing. Well God was hovering. Well, there wasn't, there was something. 
Because the, it was formless and void, but what else was there? God was. Water was there. Water was there. Because the, the spirit or the wind, the Ruach of God, was over the face of the waters. Now, why waters? So at the beginning, there was water, right? Well, okay, visualize it as he's writing it. There's a beginning with, with just water. Why water? Because life comes, from life, com life comes from water, sure. Remember we talked about water before when we were looking at Mark. And when Jesus, the story of Jesus stilling the storm, oh, yeah. what else did Jesus do? On the water. He walked on the water. What did we, what did we say? What, why was that so significant that Jesus, even more than changing weather, why was it so significant that Jesus could still this storm in the, on the lake, but also walk on the water? Control. Control. Water, water becomes this ancient image uh, for chaos. Now, that makes sense to an ancient person, right? Because imagine you are on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, right? And you look out. And what do you see when you look out? You see water, right? And ships take off and go out there. And usually they fall off the end. Of yeah. <laughs> well, they fall off the end of the earth because how do you? Why would I think they fell off the end of the earth? Because they just because that's all you can see. Off. Okay, they, that's right, and they don't come back. They don't come back, and so you see ships, and most of them come back, but not all of them come back. And you look out there, and you see storms over that water, and you can plant seeds in the ground, you can break the soil, you can do all kinds of things with earth. What do you do with water? The sea? Nothing. It's, it's like out of your control, right? Fish in it. <laughs> you fish in it, and you better hope that a big wave doesn't wash you overboard. You know, the, the water, so water becomes this image of chaos, something that human beings can't control. And that's one of the reasons why in ancient, and not just the ancient Jews, but all these ancient people who were associated with water, you know, living close to water, they would have all kinds of things living in the water. You know, you didn't have dragons walking around ground. In the Old Testament, there's no dragon walking around ground, the ground, but you had Leviathan. You had Leviathan, and where did Leviathan live? He lived in the water. What's the Leviathan? Leviathan was the great sea dragon. Okay. You know, the great sea monster that ta he talks about in Job and other places. Leviathan lives in the deep. Bohemoth lives in the deep. These are, so the, the water is this symbol of chaos. In the beginning, there was water. Whoa, now let's think about symbols. You know, we got darkness and we got water in the beginning, right? A chaotic. Now, that almost gives us a clue into the direction this story is going to go, right? Because in this watery, dark chaos, what happens? What does God do? He brings light. What, what does, what does, Separates the water. Okay, well, what does he do? What's the first thing God does in this watery chaos? He was hovering over the... He's hovering over the... Kind of tells us maybe that's the natural state of the world without God, mm -hmm. is, is just chaos. What does God do in the midst of the chaos? He calms them. What does he do? He brings light. Verse 3, what does he do? Let there be light. And he light. says, let there be light. light. Let there be light. And what happens? There Bang, there's light. He calls out light and boom, it happens. And then what happens? And he was pleased. Okay, he saw the light was good, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a theme we're going to see in this first creation story. You know, we've already got two themes right at the beginning. That God is going to be calling stuff out. God's going to be saying, let there be. In other words, what is God not doing? He's not building things with his hands, right? Mm -hmm. All he's doing is speaking, mm -hmm. right? Yep. He's, and what he ends up creating, he sees as good. And yeah, what he says, calls out, occurs right away. And he, he calls, so in this dark, chaotic mess, 
He says, let there be light, and there was light. 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 And then what does God do? He separates the light, he separates and, the the light and the darkness, and he calls the light day, day. and the darkness. No, no. Now, what is God starting to do right here? Now, at the, at the beginning, there's nothing but a dark, watery chaos. And what has God started to do? Separate. Okay. He's, he's separate. What did you say? He's building structure. He's, he's bringing order to this chaos. He's bringing order in this chaos. Now, before he, we've read anything else, we got, a, we got an idea about what he's going to be doing, right? And, and we're not going to look at each day, you know, not in detail. But what does he... So first he does light, right? Light and darkness. What's the sec, what does he do on the second day? He separates the waters. Okay, he separates the waters. Now I want you to think about that. We got a watery chaos, right? What is God, by separating the waters, what is God doing? Creating land. He's creating land in this, in this nothing but water. Like a fish tank in the big, that's all that it is. God is creating, he's separating water, he's creating a, a bubble, isn't he? He's creating a bubble in the chaos. He's separating the waters, right? Mm -hmm. There are waters above and there are waters below, below right? Mm -hmm. and, and what does he, and he brings waters together, right? Mm -hmm. And he, um, uh, uh, and it becomes oceans, you know, seas and stuff. What, what does he end up, what becomes that agent that separates the water? So you got water above, water below. What separates it? He creates a sky, right? So what God has done here is he's created this bubble in the middle of chaos, right? So inside this bubble, there is order. There's some order, right? But chaos above it, chaos below it, chaos around it. All right, day, that day two. So day one, he's creating light, right, and dark. Day, day two, he's creating the sea and the skies. Now day three, what does he do? Now what does he do on day three? Land. Now he starts talking about land. I was early. Yeah, you're a little early. You're a day early. Uh, 24 hours early. He creates, he creates land and, and dry land. And what, what does that include? The creating of dry land. Because it's not just land. What else does he do? He creates vegetation. Right. So he's creating, so he's created light on day one. He creates sky and sea on day two. He creates dry land on day three. God is bringing order to creation, right? Mm -hmm. What does he do on day four? And all of it is... All that he's made is what? Good. 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 Okay, all, it, all that he made is, is good. What does he do on day four? Creates the, uh, the um, oh, stuff. He creates the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there was, a, there was a movie made in the 70s called The Stuff. Yeah, and that one good. Uh, what, what stuff does he create? Vegetation. Well, he creates vegetation on day three. Oh, what does he create? Sun. He creates the sun and the and the stars. Ooh, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, you, you're seeing a little tiny pattern? What did he create on day one? Light. Light. What does he do on day four? Light. Light. He's doing light again, right? He created light and darkness, and now he's creating sun and stars. Ooh, day one and day four. Hmm. <laughs> we haven't looked at day, um, day five yet. But based on what he made on day two, which was the sea and the sky, what might we expect to see him do on day, on day five? Put the critters in it. No. Well, he puts the critters where? Everywhere. In the sea. He puts the, sea, in the sea. critters in the sea and critters on the land. In the, sky. in the sky, in the air. So he is now filling the, ooh, now we got a cool little pattern going on, don't we? Light on day one, lights on day four. S 
sky and sea on day two, day five, those things that what? Live in the sea and live in the sky. Day three, God created what? Dry land, right? Yeah. He created dry land. Earth. Well, now what do we expect to see on day six? Critters on the, Critters on the dry land. Okay, Crit and, and is that what happens on yes. day six? You better believe it. You better believe it. So we've got this really cool pattern that, he, that we've developed. You know, and if, if the message, and maybe this tells us something about how the writer of this story wants us to see, not just the creative process, but wants us to see creation, right? Mm -hmm. That cre there's a structure and an order to creation. There's a structure and an order to creation. Even when it doesn't need to be. You know, because there's no reason why one and four, two and five, three and six need to parallel themselves, but they do. Which shows that there's an order to creation. Every time God makes this, what does he declare? How does he do it? How does he create all of this? How does God create all of this? He says it, right? Now, what is that saying? So we've got an order to creation here. God is speaking and it occurs, right? Mm -hmm. What does it say about God? What is, what's the message about God here? That he's powerful. He's got authority. Now, understand, the, when God is mentioned here, it is not those four letters for God. It's not his proper name. It is El. It is Elohim. It is that formal God, name God. It's not Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever. It is, it is God. So all of that's consistent. Those four letters never enter this story at all. He is never called the Lord in this story. You know? and, he, and he calls this stuff into being. And everything he creates by just his authority, he declares to be good. 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 Now, why is that kind of significant? That, that God is declaring all this stuff good. Because he made it. He because he made it. Well, yes. And remember, we, I've ta we talked about it maybe when we looked at Romans, maybe before. One of, the, one of the realities in the world is the Greeks taught that the physical world was inferior to the spiritual world. The spiritual world was superior to the physical world. And in fact, they would say the physical world was because it was inferior, was actually bad. That the physical world is bad. And therefore the goal of human life is to escape the physical world and join God in the spiritual, right? Because creation is inferior. In fact, creation is kind of, kind of a bad thing. What is, what is this story, sir? Saying that we're bad and we can't be bad. Well, God made us. God made us, therefore, we are good. there's a goodness not only to us, but a goodness to creation. Now, by the time we're, we're now in the sixth day, right? Mm -hmm. it, where has human, human beings were created on day one, right? No. Two, three, four, All five, <laughs> six. Okay. You know, now, now we're getting to the six. Well, early on day six, right? Right in the morning. No, human beings it's haven't been created at all yet, yep. right? Nah. We got all, everything else has been made. And that was good. And it was good, and then humans. Uh, so humans haven't been created at all. And at he, all he also yet. told the, 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 all of the animals and fish and different things to create more, to, to go on and create, yeah, populate. And now human beings, you know, we don't get to, Excuse me. We don't get to human beings until verse 27, right? Mm -hmm. You know, everything else has been made. Now, what, again, this writer, we're talking about this, this writer, what might that say about humanity? If humanity is the last thing that God created, God's not going to create anything after human beings, what does it say about humanity? What yeah, might the writer... Be telling us about us. That we're, that we're special. Okay. That why would we? Why might we be considering ourselves special? Because God created us. But He created slugs. 
Well, the slugs are good for their own thing. And <laughs> so we, we just kind of glorified slugs. <laughs> <laughs> he created us last. He and created us. aren't as special as we well, think. We are. either not as special as we think of, or we are the best. We, we are the crown of creation. We oh, are like at the we are we are at the top of creation. That's that's now that's interesting because when he creates us, he creates us in how does how is our creation described? In his image. In his image. Of course, it gets a little confusing because he talks about our image, which means in this story, God is not alone. God is not alone in creation. We don't want to bring, bring Christological stuff in here, Christ stuff in here, because I don't think it intended, it's intended, certainly not by this writer. But uh, that's why he is called, the name for God is Elohim. And Elohim isn't God. It is God's, plural. It's the plural form of the noun El. So God is not alone in this creating process, but he creates human beings in image. Well, we don't know what that, that image is, right? Now, also, it's kind of interesting, when he's creating humanity, he says he creates humanity. How does he describe the humanity he's creating? That they would rule over the yeah, Okay, air they're going to they're gonna have, they're gonna have authority, right, mm -hmm. over creation. Maybe that has something to do with the image of God, that they are working in as sort of his representative in creation, to care for the creation as he would, as he would care yes. for creation. Okay, well, in this he creates men first, right? And, and then the man goes to sleep and he takes a rib and creates a woman, right? In, yeah. in, the, in chapter one? No. Um. Is that what it says when he creates men and women? No, it doesn't. The creation is just he created them male and female. He didn't create men and then women later. Right. You know, here in this story, what might that tell us? At least in terms of what this writer wants his reader to, to take away from the story. That there's an equality in creation. You know. Now, again, the second story has different goals. Mm -hmm. So the second story may be a little different. But we don't want to combine the story because if we combine these two stories, we cheapen both of them. In here, we've got God creating humanity at the end of creation. Male and female, he created them, both bearing his image. And they are given what? After God creates them, what does God offer humanity? What's that? God blesses, God, God blesses humanity. Okay, what, what does God want humanity to do these these male and females he's created create, create go on and produce okay the humanity needs to become pr produce what is their responsibility to take care of them. okay to take care of what the land, the land. to take care of the land to take yes, care of this yes. yeah land. to take care of this creation that they have authority but the authority is to Care, not exploit, but to care for, care, care for, care for creation, and in that way they become God's like agents. You know, we become God's agents in creation. So we're we're closing, and this is at the end. So it's kind of interesting. Humanity by this story in chapter one. Why was humanity created? To care for creation. Humanity was, cre was created for creation. File that away in this first chapter. Human beings were created to care for the rest of They are part of creation, but also to care for the creation that God has made. Okay? What else have we learned about God in this first chapter? We've already talked about it. What do we learn about when God? When he speaks. When he speaks, things happen. Things happen. Uh, what else did we learn about the creation we look at? When we look out in the world, what does the writer want us to see when we look out God into our world? Around. What's that? God's blessing. Okay, God's we want around. good God's blessing because He wants us to see something that is good. He wants us to see something that is good. 
He wants us to see something that is structured, that's organized. It's not just random. If it was random, we'd still be underwater, right? Because that's chaos. What does God do? He brings order out of chaos. Chaos. God brings order out of chaos. Now, when we get to the end of that first chapter, we haven't talked about the, the finishing of this story. We've got God having created a bubble because he said he didn't go cause the water to disappear. The water's still there. Where's the water? Above below. and below and around. Yeah, I could say Yeah, that. and around. And so we're surrounded by it. You know, and that's chaos, right? But we are a little bit of bubble. We are a little bubble within that chaos. Now, that's going to have a lot to do with the story we're going to see a little bit later. And what story do you think uh, is directly connected to this idea that God has brought and created a little bubble within the watery chaos that surrounds us? Be created. Well, true, but what story from Genesis that all of y'all know? Noah and, Noah and the ark. ark. Noah and the ark. When what God does is, and it says, opens the window of the sky, causes the water from the deep. What he does is he removes he, he removes his protection. He, he, the bubble ceases to exist, and he allows chaos to, to reign again. So, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But here God has created this bubble, and he's done it in how many days? Six. He's done it in six days. Okay. And now on the, so, and when he's finished, right? Because by the time we get to chapter two, he's done, right? He has created all of this in six days. Neat little pattern, you know, uh, one, four, two, five, three, six, you know, neat little thing done. Day seven, why would there be, need to be seven days? He rests on the seventh day. He does rest on the seventh day. Why, why would there need to be seven? Why would the writer have seven days? It's a perfect number. Ah, thank you, Barb. Seven is a perfect number. And ancient people love perfect numbers. And so seven, you know, things that are in seven, that's a heavenly number. And so creation is done by God. It is a heavenly number. Six is earthly, but seven is heavenly. So what does... My birthday's 12-7. Seven? Seven? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So it's a perfect number. It's a perfect number yeah. for a perfect person. No, I no, don't no, no, no. <laughs> But pretty good. I was born in July. That's seven, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, we know we're better. Uh, the, um, so, so. so tell the story, the writers, that, did they pick the timeline for the days? I, I think so. They picked seven was the perfect number, so they're just saying that this happened on one day, which could have been... Years right, and and I don't think I they just I think started it. It would it, they just it just started, and then they called that the first day, and then they moved on. Right after after the daylight came, after the darkness came, and then the daylight that was the next day. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I, I think that I think people are making a big mistake. If they, if they look at this story and, and one say, well, that means the world was made in, in six days. Historically, geologically. Yeah. And dinosaurs don't exist and, you know, <laughs> da, 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 da. I think they make it a big mistake. Uh, I also think it's an equally a big mistake to suggest that, oh, well, these are six phases. Because th they, that doesn't make any sense. That means the sun was created, the sun was created when? After the dry land, you know, there was no sun, but there was... An earth with dry, that doesn't make any sense. You know, and, and science, for me to believe that, I have to have, I'd have to have way more faith than I got now in things that don't make sense. And so I, I think we're making a mistake if we talk, well, this reflects stages. I think this reflects a story. How, how does this, these people, or let's, let's make it one, because it's easier to think of one person. How does this one person who wrote this, how does he want his people, the people that read it, to see the world around him? Well, he wants them to see the world around him as organized. So things don't just randomly happen. There's a structure to the world. And, and you know what? Even though people are saying, oh, no, you've got to escape this world and go to be with God in the spiritual world, he's saying, baloney, this world is, 
is good. And you know, we got a responsibility in this world, and it's to take care of it. And, and I think that's what the writer is doing, and he's using story to convey that. Uh, I, I, and again, I say that, that he's writing to a people for whom the story resonates. If, if he had said a geological history, it wouldn't have been meaningful to a people for whom geological history doesn't mean anything. It wouldn't be telling this story to them. This, this is an appropriate story for the people who are reading it. And that's why we kind of got to get into it and not try to force our opinion into it. Let the story speak without, you know, let the story speak. Yeah. Let, let the story speak instead of trying to impose our assumptions on it. And that's what I'm really going to encourage you all to do. Uh, which may mean stepping away just briefly. If you want to go back, that's fine. You know, stepping away from some of the things you may have heard mm -hmm. before. Because I, I'm not sure that's the best way to, to read it. But I've told you the same thing with the Gospels. I think it's a bad idea to combine the Gospels into one. I think you cheapen all four when you do that. Uh, you, lose the, you lose the story, you lose the meaning. So what does God do on this perfect seventh day? Rest. He, he, ends up, he ends up resting on this seventh day. And, and it, it's really interesting. He rests, and, and what does the writer say then about this seventh day? He made it holy. Okay, he's, he's made it holy. Now, he's writing to people living much later, right? After the law was given. And in the law, you know, you had a Sabbath day. So what has the writer done with the Sabbath, something that was established in the law, what has he done to that Sabbath day? He has pushed it all the way back to creation. That the Sabbath isn't just a day, isn't just a special day because it's in the law that Moses received. It's a special day because from the beginning of creation, that was God's intention. Wow. All of a sudden, that day has moved from a, a day based on solemn religious beliefs to something that is tied to the whole created order. Okay? The end to the first story, right? Now, like I said, we've got water as being something present, right? Water's a big deal because water's at the beginning, which would tell me that the people who are receiving it must be connected in some way with water, seas. Okay, let's look then in chapter 2, uh, what, beginning in verse uh, uh, 4. And how does it, and, and I think we've got a whole new creation story. And if you think about it, it sounds different. What, how does the second story in chapter 2 begin? How does it begin? What does the account of the heavens and the earth? Okay, now we're going to talk about how the heavens and the earth were, were made, right? Were created. Only we got a new name for God here, right? Because what is God called now? Lord. The Lord. Different name. We didn't see the word Lord used in the first chapter. We got a new name for God. And, and again, I think this is connected. Everything that we'll use, every writing that uses this name has some similarities to one another. So it would seem as though it's coming from either one hand or a group that shared similar perspectives. Okay, now how is the description, I love this, we got, so we got the Lord now introduced, so we got a Lord here. How, how is the world described? How is what, we saw in chapter one, it was water, right? Nothing but water at the beginning. Right now, in chapter 2, what is at the beginning? Heaven, earth and heaven. You got earth and heaven, right? And tell me what the earth looks like. It's bare. Right? It's bare. You got a bare earth. You don't have water. You don't have a watery chaos. Instead, you got a bare earth. What does that tell you about the people who are receiving this story? They must have been more associated with dry land than they were ocean, seas. So telling them about a chaotic water, they'd have said, what? You know, water's something you put in a jug. You know, what are you talking about chaos? Wouldn't have had any meaning to them. But this story starts with a dry land, right? Dry, barren 
land. Okay? Right into herders or farmers. Okay, then what does God do? And I would take note of it. What does God do? We got a barren land. What's the first thing God, the Lord, um, the Lord does in this barren land? Sent rain. Before he sends rain. Um, he calls, causes water to arise. What's the first thing he creates? He cre- oh, whoa, 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 time, whoa, whoa, time out. Chapter 1, when did he create man? Like the afternoon, like Saturday afternoon, you know, after the football games were done. That's when he created man. You know, like right at the end of the day, maybe 7.30 or so, right when Svengoolie is starting his movie. You know, that's when he creates man. When does he create man in the second story? In the beginning. He creates him at the beginning. He, he is the first, man is the first one created. And remember how he was created in chapter 1? How was humanity created? And it was humanity, right? Male and female. God said... He spoke it. How does God create man here? He gets down in the dust, in the dirt. And gets a handful of muck dirt and he shapes it into a little little bitty mud man right he shapes it into a little mud man again like I told you this this presentation of God is going to be way more personal than the one we saw in chapter 1 where God is somewhere calling things into being now God is kneeling in the dirt shaping using his hands using his hands to shape this little mud man right and we'll never look at Adam the same again. Well, you know, Adam is really interesting because we haven't used the word, he hasn't used the word Adam yet. Um, Adam means human being. That's, that's what it means in Hebrew. And Adam is, refers to human being because Adam comes from what's called the Adama. And Adama means dirt. dirt. Means dirt. So Adam is the one from... The dirt is the one from the dirt. And that's what he makes. He makes this little mud man, right? And he's got little Adam mud man here in his hands. But he's just a hunk of dirt, m- dirt clay, until God does what? Forms him. Well, he forms him. So he's got him into a little form, and he's got this little little thing. He breathes, he breathes into yep. him life. And the little mud man becomes Adam. Yeah. Adam becomes a living being. He breathes into him life. Now, that is really significant. By the way, the Jews view life. This, this really is tied to how Jews view life. Because life, the life that they share, or the Jews, is something that comes apart from them. It's breathed into them, and it's associated with breath. Breath. And that's why, you know, when you, they, there's all these de- abortion controversies, you won't have the Jews saying, conception, conception. They're not going to say it. It's breath. That's life. When you become a breathing, when you breathe. And so for Jews, that's why their view of abortion is very different than, than a lot of Christians. You know, because they don't, they don't see it as a conception thing. They see it as a breath thing. Uh, and it's grounded here because that's how Adam, that's how this mud man became a living being. God breathed into him life. Something else that becomes important, if God breathes into him life, is life something that is part of is, is life something that is, and I'm going to use the word intrinsic, I hope that makes sense, it, part of who, what Adam is, part of what Adam is, that, that, that breath, does Adam possess that? The breath. The breath, does he possess it? No. It comes from God. And when Adam dies, the on. it returns to God. Mm-hmm. But it's not soul. It's not a soul. It is breath. In, in Hebrew, the word breath is ruach, ruach. 
And Ruach refers to, it also refers to the spirit of God. So it's like God infuses in this little mud creature a part of himself, but it's not part of the nature of that mud creature. It is always something that comes apart from him. He becomes a living thing because of God. Because of God, not because of himself. Now that's that we got in this second story. So he creates human beings. So we got this little mud man who's breathing, right? And then what does God do after he creates this human being? He plants a garden, right? And he and in that garden he includes what? Oh, he puts a little man. But what's in this garden? Trees. Oh, we got trees and fruit and plants and all kinds of stuff. He's making vegetation. And why is he making all this vegetation? So I can eat. For the human being. Now remember, we said in Genesis 1, the flow was human beings were made for <coughs> creation. Here, creation is made for human beings. It's made for human beings. Because human beings came first. Or, or man, Adam, came, came first. And to put a little spice in the story, which is God put in the middle of his garden? Two trees. He puts two trees. And what are the two trees he puts in the garden? The tree of knowledge. Okay, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Okay. And knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so we got in that garden the knowledge tree of but that's we're gonna we're gonna get back to that in a little bit. So we've got that planted. And then it explains a lot of waters, right? Rivers that are flowing. Why do you think the writer would put because remember this stuff writing this stuff down is expensive. You know, having all this why do you think he would put all these details about rivers and and countries that exist during his time, but not here. You know, there was no Assyria or Cush when God... There was no other people. Yeah, there was no other, other than Adam and plants. Yeah. There's nothing else. Why do you think he would put that? All this detail about, well, there were rivers running through it and around it. and uh, Why do you think he would do it and link it to locations? So we would get to know the story? Yeah, maybe, maybe it helps us know the story, or maybe he's trying to ground the story in something we can identify. Mm -hmm. You know, something to, one, one to say, a, just a nebulous garden, but to say, you know, that's a garden located here. You know, the, um, uh, our Mormon brothers and sisters believe uh, the Garden of Eden was close to Fulton, Missouri, that that's where it was. The Garden of Eden was around Fulton, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I've been to Fulton. <laughs> what did you get out of the garden? I didn't get much. <laughs> but I dated a girl that moved to Felton. But that's another story. Uh, she I not the one you stalked. No, no, no she, wasn't, she wasn't the one I stalked. Well, I stalked her later. Oh, yeah. you know, this was a girl I stalked later. Oh. You know, before I stalked Debbie. Um, they, so, okay, so here we got this garden. Puts a little mud man in it. And, and what does he tell the little mud man? What does... What does God want from the little mud man? It's free to eat anything. Eat anything you want. Okay? Except. Anything you want. Except. Except what should you not eat? The tree of Nothing knowledge. Nothing from the tree of knowledge. Okay. You shouldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, or if you do, you're going to die. Now, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what, what do you think that means? What does that represent? Because again, we're talking about a story. What, do you, what would that represent? Showing them, you know, he's living, Adam is living a, a life of freedom, of, of being able to eat whenever he wants to, to enjoy the animals or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if he eats from the tree of knowledge, he's going to find out bad stuff. Oh, 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 oh. knowledge of good and evil. Hmm. But you get also knowledge of good. I know. Yeah, yeah, you get knowledge of good. Yeah. I, I, Shelly, I think, what's that? Ah, that's it. I think it's, that's what you're both saying. You're talking about free will. Now, if you eat from this fruit, now you're going to have to decide. You're going to have you, to decide and defend everything. Ah, uh, that's right. Because now you have to decide what is good and what is evil. Now, you're going to have to make that decision constantly, constantly. In other words, 
You got free will. You can choose one or the other. So don't eat it. Having to make that decision is going to be is going to be the death of you. Yeah. Having to make that decision. Now, what does that then infer before you eat that from that tree? Of course, we're going to want it. Well, for 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 Adam here in this garden, in a sense, has absolute complete freedom mm -hmm. because he never has to make a choice. He doesn't have to choose because all he has is good. Yes. You know, if you don't have evil as a choice, you don't have to decide, should I do that or should I not do it? That's a decision he doesn't have to make because all choices are good. You know, once you introduce the knowledge of good and evil, now you have to choose. Yeah. And that going to, that's going to become the story of humanity. And that's, what you, that's why when in Romans, you know, talks about being free. You know, we sin, the power of sin is broken. You know, that, that we become free from that bondage of having to constantly choose right and wrong because wrong no longer exists. You know, a restoration of paradise, that's the, the new creation in, in Revelation. Well, you don't have to choose between good and evil because there's only good. But here, so don't do it. Now, again, he's telling a story, guys. You know, it's not, he's not writing history because nobody's there to write it. You know, it's not like Adam is keeping a diary, you know, because it would have said it. You know, it, it, he's telling this, the writer's telling us a story about why, how we got to the place we are, how this happened. Now, to this point, we don't know why. God says, don't eat from this tree. We don't know why. We just know you're not, we're not supposed to do it. Right. And so now, so we go on, so, but we're going to find that out later. We'll find that out in chapter 3. What does God do for this little mud man he made? So he's got to build him a garden. He and he can name. eat in the garden. He can have all kinds he, of stuff. He gets to name everything. Well, yeah, well, we're not even at everything yet. Because he looks down at that little mud man and he says, yeah, well, you know, he sees a little mud man and you know what he's doing? He's lonely. Well, yeah, he's talking to a broccoli. A broccoli. You know, he's, he's talking to a broccoli. And God says, man, that is crazy. You know, that all he's got around him are vegetables. You know, you can't have much of a relationship with a broccoli, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And so God says what? This guy is lonely. So what am I going to do for him? Make him a partner. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll you'll make him a helper. But God doesn't start with making him a a, a lady friend. What does? How does God start? He's going to start making animals because you know, you know, a, a good dog is better than a broccoli. You know, is you know that's that's better than a, you know a cucumber. You know, so he starts making he starts making animals, right? For, again, we got the same thing that God's creation is for man. For man, where in chapter one, man was for creation, you know, to take care of creation. So God is making these things, right? And, and it's interesting when you think about how God is making them. How does God make these animals? He thought of them. Well, does he say them? He forms them out of the ground. Gee, I'm experiencing deja vu all over again. Who did, a, who did God form out of the ground? Man, how is he forming these animals? Out of the ground. So how are these animals living? He breathed life into them. He breathed life, breath He's life. breathing life into them. Whoa! That means, wow, that the origin of the animals... It's the same as the origin for man. for man. And the spirit that animates them, that causes them to live, is the same spirit that causes us to live. How then should we view? I mean, in chapter 1, we viewed the animals as something we need to care for. God creates the animals to be, you know, as maybe somebody that will be a companion for Adam, creates them in the same way, with the same book. How do we, how might the writer be suggesting we view anim our animal friends? They're the same as us. 
You know, they come from the same origin as us. They have the same spirit as we have. That's why they live. Now you're getting way out there because now you start thinking hope. Yeah, hope, because it's, things will, will change. Yeah. You know, it, 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 especially around the flood. But here, <coughs> isn't that what he's saying? God formed the animals out of mud. God formed us out of mud. God breathed into us the breath of life. God breathed into them the breath of life. So in this story, what's the difference? A human. Mm-hmm. And they were created for us, you know. Whoa, this we're is kind of heavy. Superior. This is kind of heavy stuff, isn't it? We're superior to most animals. Yeah, well, and certainly that's that is the story. Oh, yes, yeah. that's yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to come back as a dog. Uh, the, um, <laughs> but I think look this down, is look at the life she lived. <laughs> <laughs> now you know, if an alien came down and saw how I treat her, which one would he assume? Is in control. Her. Her. She is. And she is. <laughs> especially, especially if he saw me walking her in the morning with my little bag, scooping up her, her poop. You know, that alien would say, look, that poor creature following around their masters, picking up their poop and putting them into bags. <laughs> <laughs> is any alien going to say, oh, the superior creature is the poop collector? <laughs> you know, that's the one we need to deal, do business with. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. You know, he's going to be trying to talk to her. Yeah. You know, not me. Uh, so, well, I don't know. That's just that's it. But, that, but it, it, certainly, it certainly changes the way animals are presented here in this story. But which, caring for the animals. I mean, well, like yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, this story, we're not really dealing with the care. You know, because he, again, his point is different. Okay. You know, in fact, if we get to this point in the story, just leaving it here, that in the first one, we talked about God bringing structure and God bringing, and we have a responsibility and all that kind of jazz. What can we say about the second story. What do we say? What can we say about God according to chapter two? If the first one we could say God is all powerful, calls everything into being by His voice, and it's a very structured creation, what can we say about God in chapter two? The Lord God. He gives life. He's the source of life. Does He like us? Does He like humanity? He, he, he really does. Us. He loves us. He really does. Not only did he give us life, but he put us in a garden and cared enough for us to create animals for us. And then he still saw that Adam was lonely. And what did he do? He got him a helpmate. He got him a helpmate. And from Adam came woman, came Eve. And so in if the first one is this God, all-powerful God, Lord of the universe, calling light into being, now we've got the image of a God who kneels in the dirt to shape a human being with his own hands. That must be why when we're children we love making mud pies. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe the writer is aware. Just, maybe yeah. the writer's aware of that. That that's something that, <laughs> that we did. do. Yeah. yeah. And that and that only we can't make it living. No. We can't make those mud pies of living. But the God does it. He, he really likes, he really likes this mud man he created, you know, enough mm -hmm. that he would really care. So, see, we've got these two stories that are, are very different in intent. And you can't really combine them because the God who is somewhere and calls things into being says, human beings, is a heck of a lot different than the one who shapes human beings with his hands. You know, we got a we got a different image. Which one is right? Which one is right? Both. Because both tell us about who God is, right? Mm -hmm. That God is the Lord of the universe who calls things into being. But God also loves the things that he made. He really does. God tells us about the creation, right? That human beings 
uh, the crown of creation, but we have a responsibility. But also that all things were made for us. So we're not just at the crown, the last thing made. The last is the best. But we're the first, which is also the best. Neither one has us in the middle. You know, and, and in both we have God being in control. So we've got these two stories in Genesis. And what I want to challenge you to do is don't combine them. Let them stand. And let them both speak. Uh, let them both speak. Now, next time when we get together, we're going to continue this because we've got some loose ends, right? We've got Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? We've got to talk about, now this may be human, the human high point. We are at our highest point right now, right? We're going to start slipping. And again, yeah, we're going to have a snake in the grass. Uh, the, uh, we're, going to, we're going to slip from there. For years, I did a, a workshop at, at different places. And I would do the Bible in 90 minutes. That was the name of the workshop. The Bible in 90 minutes. I would do the entire Bible in 90 minutes. Um, and you understand anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. Uh, we do the Bible in 90 minutes. I think what we see here, and I'm going to point this out to you, because I think this is a pattern we see in Genesis that we see occurring in, in, in the compiler of Genesis that we're going to start seeing next week. Uh, because humanity is not going to is going to inevitably is going to is going to slide. Disappointing. Yeah. Well, some people would say humanity grew up in the Eden. That's when humanity grew up and started making decisions for itself. So it's. But we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about the sons of Adam and Eve, uh, because humanity is going to drop another notch with the boys. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. We thought that would be good if you had two sons to name one Cain, one Abel. Maybe twins. That would be, they would be fighting all the time. You know. They all do. Right. <laughs> they do, yeah. You don't have to name them anything. I name them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, have a, uh, let's have a word of prayer and then go home. Uh, Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together and, and help us to recognize and to accept both your enormous authority and, and structure and mind, but also help us to accept that you are also intimate and close and, and loving. Help us to recognize both of these aspects of you revealed in the stories we read. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you.